Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Mikhail. I'm a research and development uh, engineer in a CEA uh, list in France. And together with my colleague, Matthew, I started developing uh, a chisel backend for timing predictability. So uh, we add a little bit of a different flavor to what we have seen, uh, seen today. So we'll try to motivate the talk, uh, what exactly is timing predictability, why do we work on this topic. Then we look for um, the two actors involved in this one, so that the, the language that uh, is the input language is chisel, the output language will be a formal specification language uh, named TLA+. Plus. Then we look at the time uh, uh, of, of an example, which is a processor, and a small one, and uh, we show a little bit of code and how exactly we, uh, what we aim to do and what, how exactly we do it. More language issues uh, from Chisel, and then we, we end up with some conclusions. So in three keywords, if you want, so we'll be looking at proving timing properties. We'll be looking to, to generate automatically some formal models from Chisel code and we look to um, understand the language semantics that is coming from, from Chisel. All right, so let's, let's uh, have a look first of the motivation. So uh, timing reasoning uh, is extremely important in the kind of system that we are interested in. So we look at safety critical systems that you find usually in avionics and automotive and there are those systems that are subjected to strong timing requirements. So we'd like to prove properties about the systems that they, they will respect the deadlines. And then when we look at uh, this timing requirements and proofs, we end up um, doing worst case execution time or worst case response time, and in general, worst case timing reasoning. And this worst case timing reasoning will give you um, safe bounds and desirably uh, tight bounds as well. So looking at this kind of systems, um, we have systems that are analyzable from a timing perspective, and this will say they are time predictable systems, and you have systems which are a bit more complex and they are difficult to analyze, and those are unpredictable ones, All right? And in our context of safety critical systems, we look at a pair of binaries which means the software or the code that is executed on some platform. For us, the platform will be actually specified in Chisel, right? So looking at this code and the platform, we actually have intuitively two ways of advancing the computation in time. So one of them is instruction driven. So you execute code and you progress with your execution doing more instructions while at the, the platform level, you, you, you see everything in terms of cycles. So it, you have obviously a gap between the two of them, and the gap will be captured by something which is named the timing model. So you would like basically to capture the execution of a code on an architecture, and then you have to bridge the gap between the two of them, and you have to um, provide a function which is, a, which, is a, which is a timing model. So this function may capture more or less accurately what happens in your system. So in uh, general, it won't be an exact mapping of uh, code uh, advancement and timing, but you'll have some abstractions. So a couple of examples of these timing models. So you have on one hand a, a simple one where each instruction it will be mapped, each instruction will be mapped to, to its latency through, through, the, through the execution on the, on the platform, or you can have, you can lift a little bit the granularity and you can look at code fragments, or as, a, as they are known as basic blocks, so code fragments with a single entry and a single exit, and they are executed in some, let's say, on the, on the pipeline. So, so you have a different uh, granularity, I'm sorry. All right, so how exactly to do this? So we look to derive timing models directly from chisel designs, and we look to prove them as well. Uh, so in principle, what we like to do is to basically provide some formalization for on, on the both sides, on the um, software side and on the hardware side. I can use, uh, I can use this terminology. 
and to make sure that we actually uh, have a match uh, be between the two of them. So we'll be constructing formal mo uh, models of the instruction set architecture and the formal models of the, um, of the chip, of the hardware, and then we'll try to, to match the, the timing. And today I will be presenting this kind of transformation. So we look at the chisel code as an input code, and we'll try to, to look at the TLA plus, the formal specification language, um, as um, at the end of this transformation. All right, so let's meet the actors. So chisel comes with, is actually um, a two-layered language, if you want. So you have a host language, which is Scala, and Scala is um, generic programming languages, if you want, that gives you, um, is very powerful, gives you a lot of features. Uh, so you have timing inferences, you have classes and objects, so you have things from object-oriented programming as, as well as the functional programming. And then on top of this one, you have a chisel where uh, domain-specific notions, so you have ports and registers and wire and everything you need to, to write uh, hardware designs. So when you look at the p a particular class or a p uh, particular code in Chisel, you'll find notions or semantic notions from both languages. And then, for example, in, in, in this, uh, this example, we have a bundle which has an input A and an output B. And Chisel is even more advanced than this, so it will actually provide constructs that will flip completely the, the, um, the behavior that I have just explained using this uh, semantic construct, which is called flipped. All right, so we have, a, on one hand, this kind of language. And the target one, we try to, to actually, uh, the keyword for, for our transformation is traceability. So we like really to have a formal specification, but we like to have it in a readable form. So we like to preserve as much as, as we can the, the way the code, the original code is constructed. So we would use for this one TLA plus from Leslie Lamport, and he describes it the best. Uh, it allows to specify or to model hardware above the circuit level, which is in a way if Chisel is doing to provide these high level constructs, right? So, Oh, and for a formal specification, we have uh, on one hand um, uh, TLA plus that models the, the, the system as a set of behaviors and we'll specify the input state and we'll specify the transition system. So a specification that we aim for to generate automatically is of this kind. So we have uh, the initial state and then always we'll have a transition in a transitional system, okay? So more in details. And just to give a flavor of the language, we'll have, uh, I'll be having some snapshots. Uh, we have a module system. We have data structure. TLA plus is untyped. Uh, it relies on set theory. And it uses a, a notion from the name uh, temporal logic of actions. It uses some actions. Um, then the, the purpose of, uh, of this one is to actually use model checking techniques and check timing properties. And intuitively, we looked at uh, what we have between the two languages, and we say, so we have some modules in, in TLA plus, and we can map them to classes and objects in, uh, in uh, Chisel. For data types, we have a, a big semantic gap. On one, is, on one hand, we, uh, it is untyped. On the other hand, it is uh, very rich in, in typing information. So there are certain things that we can do easier than others, and certain things which are actually quite complicated. So we look at, a, a look at an example. So uh, as an example, we, we consider first probably one of the simplest processors, but the smallest processor in the world is, is Martin uh, Schober, uh, who is having a talk in, in, in around half an hour, uh, call it. So it is a sequential 8-bit uh, accumulator processor. On the software side, on the ISA, it has all the, the basic subset of uh, um, operations, so we have load store, conditional and unconditional branches, yield operation, and so on. And uh, on the hardware side, you have the accumulator registers and of particular interest, because I will be using it as examples, we have a single on-chip memory, which is split in two, part for the code and part for the instruction. All right? 
So together with uh, Martin, we decided, and some colleagues of us, uh, we, we said, okay, so let's look how we can actually map in an intuitive way this one. Okay, so I'll be using uh, several snapshots of, um, of chisel code that will be describing the memory, how the memory will be actually importing the processor, and how we actually can specify an FSM. Okay, um, so we remember or we recall that we always look to map this kind of code on this kind of formal specification. So one of the one of the elements in the code is that, for example, I can uh, I can write at the memory address some data when I have a write enable signal, right? So the specification will will, will be looking like this. So all the the signals if you want to order the registers and all the wires will be actually represented in a specification on two sides, on, on the initialization side as well as on the um, transitional um, transition predicate. Okay? And will be I'm, I'm sorry it's too fast. Okay. So the conditions will be generated um, which will guard actually the actual update. So, so this piece of uh, TLA plus code will actually represent what we have here as uh, an update of the memory, okay? So it allows us to um, keep a naming, which is very good for traceability. We can look at two pieces of code, we see the same naming, and then we have um, um, a clear understanding. But it allows us to do more. So. Uh, I mentioned about modules. So in, in the processor code, we can, the, the, the modules um, memory can be imported. So this one will actually allow us in TLA plus to have instances of, a, of the previously defined module and to use these instances and to access functions or to access things. So again, um, we think we, we can preserve, we were, we're able to preserve some of the functionality, right? We look at more things, and some are easy to do. Uh, for example, the a new uh, construct, which is just a direct translation into uh, um, local variables uh, decla uh, declared here. Uh, or for SM, FS, uh, FSM, uh, we'll be having uh, in, the, in the chisel code Depending on some, uh, some switch statement, depending on the state, then we have some conditions, and then we have certain updates that are, uh, that are going to happen. So we have to really collect all the conditions, create all the context, and this will give you exactly the, the entire set of things that can happen from a conditional side of view. And then if we look at one of them, so for example, the, the update of a, an output register, this one would be guarded in, in the TLA plus language by the, the first condition which is stating that I'm in the fetch state, and then the second condition which will actually will state exactly this. So again, traceability so is the, the keyword here. Um, all right, so while we did this, so the, um, we discovered, we actually we didn't intend to, but it just happened, so we discovered some both functional and, and uh, timing issues, okay? Some, uh, some of them were actually unknown to the, to the processor designer. But what was very interesting for us is to really prove the timing model. So in this case, again, I'll repeat, the timing model was that we'll be met, we, we mapped instructions to um, their latencies and uh, we'll be, uh, as a timing model, we will be taking the conjunction of all this um, instruction in ISA with their corresponding timing model, prove them over the hardware. How exactly we did this? Um, so uh, we encoded, I'm sorry, uh, we, we encoded the timing behavior of each instruction as invariant. So you have the, the specification TLA plus of the circuit and then for a, you like to say for a particular instruction that let's say take two cycles, what you do is from the moment the instruction starts to execute to the moment the instruction terminates, 
you'll count how many cycles you'll be doing, and you would like to prove that re regardless of what is the input state, for all the possible combinations, whenever you'll be executed that instruction, you cannot find something which takes more than two cycles. So in this way, you, you bound, in the worst case scenario, you bound the timing execution of an instruction. So we did this for the entire language, all right? And uh, the model that we have obtained models absolutely everything in the, in, the, um, in the processor, in the chisel code, but that proved to be quite expensive. So we, we end up with, with some running times um, uh, for this one, even if it is a single, a simple processor, we, we took around 50 minutes, all right? So that was one, but then we look at more um, advanced stuff. So uh, we try progressively to increase the difficulty. So we look at uh, SODOR, which is an uh, educational collective. So it's, um, again, a simple risk pipe integer pipelines uh, with various degrees of complexity. But the chisel that it is used there is largely more complex. So let's, let's consider, for example, what kind of inferences or what kind of things we have to consider when we do this transformation automatically. So uh, let's consider this line, uh, this update, and uh, just to have a feeling of how, how it exactly it will be going on. So uh, the focus is on the left-hand side. We have uh, quite a number of uh, field accesses, and this one will trigger, from a language perspective, a chain of uh, semantic things that will collect during the, during the inferencing code. All right, so you have the I.O., uh, so you have this thing that we'll be collecting, and then um, because we, we have this module now, we open it again, and we collect a flipped. As I have explained earlier, we moved on, we collect another flip, and then we have a decoupled I.O., and if we look at the decoupled I.O., we say, okay, so what exactly is this? So... Uh, read the documentation and you see that actually in Chisel, you, you'll, um, if you have two modules, you'll have um, a producer-consumer uh, kind of relation between them where you have some bits which will uh, do the handshaking uh, synchronization between the modules and then you have some data that it will be transformed. So the bits from this side will actually be this bit. So once you decide which one is the producer and which are the consumer, you have to decide at what time, and this is very important for us, for the timing of it, uh, we, we actually transfer. So then decouple will create a producer, flip decouple obviously will create a consumer, and if we have a decoupled I.O., we add more semantics into, the, uh, into this problem, because now, regardless of the value of ready and valid, if, they are, if the um, handshaking um, signals are, uh, are set or not set, there is no guarantee that you will do the transfer, all right? So in order to really uh, represent everything in this uh, in TLA plus semantics, we have to consider the whole picture. So this is just an example. So things are uh, getting a, a, a lot more complex, all right? I will be concluding this. Um, so we looked at, uh, we are looking at safety critical system. We look to prove properties of code running on platforms. We like to build automatically uh, formal specifications uh, with trace traceability considerations in mind. And we are always forced to do some semantic trade-off between the two languages. All right, so thank you very much. <laughs>